I was an 18-year-old woman at the time this story began. I want to preface the story by saying that due to a lot of extreme abuse and trauma that I endured, which we won't go into for the story, I was a massive doormat for a good chunk of my life. I genuinely didn't know what I deserved. I was very used to handling issues entirely on my own without realizing that reaching for help was an option. And I often bent over backwards and gave multiple chances to people who didn't deserve it. A lot of those past patterns of behavior molded how I handled the situation. With that out of the way, here's the story. I was in my first year of a two-year college that I'd started out at to save money. I was honestly really excited for this part of my life to begin. My childhood had been hell, but now I was going to step into adulthood and start achieving my own dreams. There was an adjustment period, of course, but nothing I couldn't handle compared to the shit I'd been dealing with before I got there, and I found myself thriving for the first time in my life in this college environment. I flourished, discovering what things I truly enjoyed and cared about, and I made many friends several of which I'm still extremely close with today. In my first semester, I became especially fond of visiting the fine arts building in between classes. There was a lobby area on one end of the building that was almost always empty and quiet, so I liked to chill there to take a break or catch up on classwork. That was where I first met Matthew. I had been sitting in a corner with several lounge chairs when he approached, asking if he could have a seat there. I said yes, of course, and I was about to get back into whatever I'd been working on when he struck up a conversation, saying that he hadn't seen me around before. I've always been friendly and social, so it was pretty easy to strike up a conversation from there, where we talked about how long we'd been at school, what kind of classes we were taking, and what we were hoping to do with our educations in the future. The conversation was honestly unremarkable just a standard get-to-know-you kind of thing. He'd been a little awkward, but nothing creepy, and some awkwardness never even bothered me anyway. We're all a little weird and awkward, after all. We had chatted a bit until I had to head off to my next class, and he asked if I often hung out in the building. I didn't think anything at the time of saying that. Yeah, I usually hang out there between my classes. I smiled at him, and I said maybe I'd see him around again sometime wishing him luck in his studies before taking off. It would be far from the last time I would see him. I had classes on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I saw Matthew in the fine arts building on each of those days from there on out. About the second or third time I saw him, after telling me about some dreams he had and what he hoped to accomplish in the future, he explained that he's autistic and that he has a hard time connecting with others because of it. So he said he was glad he'd met me. I have an autistic older brother who also had his own challenges, you know, with how judgmental and impatient neurotypicals can be, so I was primed to be soft, honestly. The first couple of weeks of knowing him were pretty normal. He was a little touchy, and sometimes he didn't even seem to understand boundaries very well. But nothing was a massive red flag to me. Yet. Some people just don't get boundaries as well as others or they don't expect as much personal space. No biggie, I thought. Then he began complimenting me. It had started out simple, like saying that I was pretty, funny, or sweet. I would thank him for the compliments, but in a very neutral manner, wanting to be sure I didn't come across as if I was leading him on. Despite this, the compliments soon became sexual in nature, increasing in how graphic or descriptive they were as he went. He'd make specific remarks about certain parts of my body, and would also comment a lot on my punk goth attire, and how much my clothes really turned him on, and how it was part of a larger fetish of his. The topics of conversation became increasingly sexual as well, always seeming to veer into a territory that I wasn't comfortable with. Even if he wasn't referring to me directly in a sexual manner, it was obvious that he was trying to initiate something. As I said before, I had no idea how to stick up for myself, so I would just tell him the topics that made me uncomfortable, and I'd ask him to stop. He'd apologize right away and say he wanted to respect me, but inevitably, 
after a little cool down, he'd start up the same inappropriate topics yet again. I started trying to spend time elsewhere, and when I was in the fine arts building where he'd always weirdly seemed to be, I tried to ignore him during my time there, saying things like that I was really busy or that I needed to do some schoolwork. Then one day, I remember him getting really serious and saying something like, You know, I feel like you're the only one I can trust. You're so understanding. I really feel like I can tell you anything. Actually, there's been something on my mind. Can I talk to you about it? I've never told anyone before. I stupidly said yes, and I don't know what the hell I thought he was going to say, but it wasn't what ended up coming out of his mouth. Without preamble, he begins to tell me that he has a kink for strangulation. Okay, no biggie. Tons of folks I know who are into that. And I don't mind a little choking myself, so no shocker. But then he goes on to say that he likes the idea of choking a woman almost to death during sex. That he wants to see them cry. That he wants them to begin to fight. That he wants them to panic and think that he's crossed the line. That ideally, he can make someone pass out from choking them during the act and then keep them going. So that they'd actually look like they were dead. I have no time to process that before he's telling me how he also has a fetish for cutting a sexual partner. He wants to cut someone during sex and then smear their blood around and drink it. Again, I can't even process before he's asking me if I'm in Satanism just because of my goth attire. Cliché and absurd, I know. He says he's a Satanist, and he starts ranting on about some kind of nonsensical shit and how it all ties into his kinks. This dude was definitely never a Satanist, as I've met a couple since that time and done some reading up on it, and no Satanist I know acts like that. He was obviously just trying to be edgy, but it was still unhinged and freaky as hell. Then the conversations escalate a step further, as he then admits that he doesn't just want to do these things to anyone, but that he specifically wants to do them to me. He wants to cut me, he wants to drain my blood. He wants to choke me. He wants me to scream and cry. I just feel a spiritual connection with you that I've never felt with anyone before. I know we'd be perfect for each other if you'll give me a chance. He said. I don't remember exactly what I said to him at the time, but I know that I basically made him some bullshit excuse about why I had to leave and get the fuck out of there. More massively uncomfortable than I'd been in a long time. It also didn't help that I'd given him my number some weeks ago, and I had texts pouring in from him for the rest of the day, saying things like, Hey, thanks for listening to me earlier. You're seriously amazing. Are you okay? I didn't freak you out or anything, did I? I'm so sorry. Seriously. If I did anything to upset you, I'm sorry. Please say something. I'm getting really freaked out. I won't ever mention the things I did today again. I just need you to talk to me. I ignored him. After that incident, I had started distancing myself from him in every single way that I could. I'd try and stay away from the buildings that I knew he'd be in at the times I knew he'd be there. It was miserable. It felt like I couldn't go anywhere or do anything without looking over my shoulder. He caught on quick that I wasn't in the same buildings anymore as well especially when I wouldn't answer his obsessive texts and calls, and ultimately blocked him. After a couple of weeks, he finally staked out at a central point of the campus, skipping one of his classes just to find out where I was walking. He spotted me, and just like that, he ran up to me and then spoke in this very cheerful, borderline childish voice. Hey, there you are! Where have you been? It's been impossible to catch you lately. Could this guy not take the hint? Obviously not. I remember laughing very awkwardly and making some kind of lame joke before trying to dismiss myself. Playing hard to get. That's hot. Yeah, he definitely wasn't getting it. I kept dutifully avoiding him while also trying to be with other people more often so I wasn't stuck alone. Often I'd sit with other friends I made between classes or at lunch to avoid him, but even that wasn't working. 
One day I heard him shouting my name from behind as I was heading to the cafeteria. I pretended not to hear him and increased my pace, practically run walking into the building to where my friends were and then flinging myself into the remaining seat at the table. I really thought that he wouldn't approach me since I was with so many other people, but he actually came up and tried to sit down with us. I was about to try and say something when one of my friends at the table hastily made some kind of excuse as to why he couldn't sit with us, with all the others at the table quickly joining in and insisting until he left. I was shocked. Had she noticed I was uncomfortable? After he was gone, I got the explanation as to why she and the others were so keen on getting rid of him. One of the girls, who's still one of my best friends to this day, had actually admitted to me that she actually knew who I was the day we'd met. Why, you may ask? Because months ago in the campus library, she'd been sitting in the computer lab section next to Matthew, who was a complete stranger to her at the time. At some point, he had tapped on her shoulder and pointed to his computer screen, which had my Facebook page pulled up on it. She's gorgeous, right? He said. My friend agreed. Yeah, I'm planning on making her mine. That information would have been horrid enough, but then everyone else at the table began to explain that this had happened with several people. He had essentially been going around campus and showing my photo to all kinds of people, then telling them strange things ranging from he was going to date me, to we are dating, to even that we're in a deviant sexual relationship. So when everyone at the table saw him following after me, they were shocked that he was still up to his shit, and they were quick to defend me. I was disgusted by this. I mean, I knew he had a fixation on me and had been trying to follow me around, but I had no idea that he spent all this time stalking my social media, as well as spreading around rumors about us all around campus. I was quick to block him on social media too, and log down my privacy settings to the max. After that day though, the situation only got worse. I began to find notes on my desk in my first class of the day. He was getting there before me to leave them there. He knew exactly which classroom that I was in and what time in the exact seat that I would be in. But that wasn't all. I was finding notes on my car's windshield, sometimes just on campus, but other times I'd find notes on my car at grocery stores, malls, restaurants, etc. Sometimes up to an hour away from the campus. The notes ranged from things like I love you to weird cringy poetry to things so explicit that I can't even write them here. But the point was, he was following me around and not just on campus. I felt like there was nothing I could do. I didn't want to ask for any help. I didn't even know where to start. I didn't want to overreact and I had a bad opinion of police based on past experiences. Then his behavior had also shifted. While he'd stopped approaching me on campus, I'd still see him all the time always looming somewhere nearby. If you've ever seen the movie It Follows, it almost felt like something like that. A figure always lurking somewhere in the background, eyes trained on you, watching, waiting, and then slowly making their way towards you, stuck to you like a damn shadow. Even when I couldn't see him in the crowd, I knew he was there. I could feel his eyes on me. He was often around so often I couldn't even walk back to my car anymore without someone accompanying me or having someone on the phone for safety. My friends were and still are truly great people, and they really got fed up with the situation and, in an effort to look out for me, actually ended up going to the campus police. The reception was honestly unexpected. The campus police acted annoyed that my friends had even come by to bring this up acting as though this was a tremendous overreaction on their part, and ultimately saying that they couldn't do anything to Matthew because he hadn't done anything to me. For about a year, the same pattern continued. The notes, the hovering, the feeling of being watched. I felt like he was constantly breathing down my neck. Though he'd stopped approaching me, he had no issue approaching the people I'd become friends with, especially the men. He'd rush up to them out of the blue, often with some of these friends not even knowing who the fuck he was at the time, before he'd then start angrily shouting at them, asking who they were 
and why they were hanging out with me. It felt like it never end, and I had no idea who to talk to. I thought my only option was to just keep my head down and push forward. Then he'd just eventually lose interest. All I wanted to do was keep living my life and enjoying college. I wanted to finish my two years so I could go on to the university of my choice and start the rest of my life. I'd been used to keeping my head down through abuse and mistreatment in the past, so I think that continuing to do it in the face of Matthew stalking was almost second nature, though I realized the ways I could have handled things differently now. Then suddenly, a new semester of college began, and poof, he was gone. No more filling of eyes on me, no more seeing him around campus. Eventually, after some asking around, my friends and I learned that he had apparently stopped attending classes there. Finally, finally I'd be free, and it really did seem that way for a while. No more weird confrontations, no more sightings of him, no more notes, no more messages or calls from random phone numbers or social media accounts. It was like he'd finally moved on, or now that it was no longer convenient for him to stalk me, he just called it quits. Over a year of this freak stalking, and suddenly it was just done. Well, good riddance, I thought. Just like that, another year had passed, and everything was really going great. I had graduated from my two-year college, but I was taking a short break from school to work. I was also saving up some money, and reconsidering what I wanted to spend my next two years working towards. It was just another average day like any other. I was chilling around my place and messing around on the computer when I logged into the online art sharing account I had, which I'd been using to post poetry and short works of fiction over the years. Curiously, I had a message from someone new, so I checked it out. Hey, I think I know you. It looks like we have some mutuals on here from the two-year college. Sorry for the random message, but I recognized your photo and I wanted to finally reach out. I'm Matthew's cousin, Patrick. I can't tell you how happy it makes me that Matthew's engaged to such a great girl. He talks about you all the time. Anyways, sorry if this is weird, but I just wanted to give a shout and say welcome to the family. I felt my stomach vanish and my heart completely exploded. I was so nauseous and my head was spinning and my ears were full of static. No way. No fucking way. I was in disbelief. I couldn't believe that nearly three years from when I first met Matthew, he was still apparently very obsessed with me. I took a deep breath, keeping my head before messaging back. I needed more information. As politely as I could, I asked Patrick what the hell he was talking about, and I then explained my side of the story. I told him that Matthew and I were not now and had never been in any kind of romantic relationship, and that it had also been ages since I'd even last spoken to Matthew. Patrick was obviously shocked, but was thankfully extremely gracious. He said that he wished he could say he was surprised, but he wasn't shocked that his cousin was capable of this level of creepy behavior, but that he really wanted to believe that he'd turned a corner with me as his fiance. He then went on to pour the tea to the max. He explained that Matthew talks about me constantly to everyone, and not just in person, but online too. In his message, he sent me to one of those personal private blog spaces that used to be way more popular, and I felt sick when I saw it. The entire blog was dedicated to Matthew's life, except it wasn't really his life at all. It was just one giant fabrication. He'd essentially created an entire alternate reality where he and I were together and engaged. He had countless posts about our perfect love and how we were meant to be. He had countless made-up stories from dates and trips we'd been on together, to the wedding we were planning and even our sex life, which I might add he went into extremely graphic detail, talking about how I enjoyed being cut, having drank my blood, and being choked. All the shit he talked about before. There were even pictures of me on the site, which he'd obviously saved from my Facebook before I blocked him. But more disturbing were the photos that weren't even from Facebook, that had obviously been taken without my knowledge. I was in a state of absolute shock, or at least I was at first. 
but faster than you'd expect. The shock turned into a burning anger. But even so, I still had to go to work that evening, and I headed to the local pharmacy I worked at in a kind of rage I've never felt before. And it showed. My manager, who I was very close to and still am today, asked me what was going on. He was used to my cheerful nature on the job, and he knew that something serious was up. So I spilled the beans on everything. His reaction had been expected. He was furious for me, and he wanted to get the police involved. But as I said before, I still didn't trust the police. I didn't trust that they'd take my case seriously or take any genuine action. I was honestly embarrassed in my situation, and I was afraid I'd be seen as making a big deal out of nothing. I said I'd think about it just to placate my boss. But by the time my break rolled around, my anger had come to a head. I had grown out of some of my doormat nature and was incensed. How dare he use me like this? In a moment of fury, I unblocked his number and called him, hoping that his number was the same. The second he answered his phone, and I then recognized that irritating little voice of his, I went totally off. I gave him no chance to speak. I can't even remember everything I said at the time because I was seeing red. All I know is that I was practically yelling into the phone, telling him that I knew every last thing he was up to, and that if he didn't end it today, I was going to make sure he paid. He was sobbing on the other end of the phone, begging me not to be angry, saying that he loved me and that he didn't mean for things to go so far. He pleaded for me to make it up to me, but I just told him that he can make it up to me by stopping all this shit and never speaking to me again before I then hung up and then blocked him. I received several calls throughout the evening and into the night from random numbers. It was obviously him. I ignored them, blocking them one by one as they came in. After around midnight, after we closed up and finished all of our closing duties, my manager recalled he still had a couple of things that he wanted to do real quick. I said okay, but I waved goodbye to him, and I said I was going to head out. He started to frown, then telling me, No way. Wait a minute. I'll walk you to your car. I wasn't used to anyone trying to take care of me, and so I felt like an inconvenience. I told him he didn't need to do that. No, you're waiting for me, or it's a write-up. His voice was so stern, I really didn't know what the hell to say. I knew there was no way he could actually justify that, but he was so damn serious about the whole thing that I agreed to wait. After another 10 minutes or so, he wrapped up and we headed out. We started walking to my car. When I see it, we both see it at the same time. A dark car with its lights off, trying to hide ever so slightly behind the building, but peeking out enough that they could see into the front lot. My eyes widened, but my manager, a real tall, built like a brick shithouse guy, had had it. His face turned bright red, and instantly he began stalking up to the vehicle, booming at the top of his lungs to whoever was in the car, threatening to call the police and beat their ass. Faster than I'd ever seen, the car's engine turned over, the lights came on, and it screamed out of the parking lot. Neither one of us saw who was inside, and I have no proof of who was in there, but I know it was him. We both knew it. I didn't cry. I didn't break down. I didn't get anxious. I was just so stunned, but I'm also relieved and thankful for my manager that all I could be was grateful. We stood there for a minute before my manager insisted on following me home just to make sure I arrived home safely. We made it back without incident. I thanked him up and down for that, and I ended up baking him his favorite pie the following week, as well as making a meal for his family as a thank you. I know it seems like there should be a big follow-up to this, that I saw a car sitting outside my house a few months later, or I got some random phone calls or heard knocks on my windows. But no, nothing. The blog site was gone not long after, and despite doing some digging, I couldn't find it under any other alternate names. That car never showed up in my work again, and I moved on to my university of choice without hearing anything more from or about this guy. It was really freaky how it all seemed to die right there. I felt like I couldn't trust it for a long time, 
given that I thought his obsession died before, only to discover that it had just been kindling in the background. It's been over ten years since that whole nightmare first began, and I'm doing really well for myself now. I've done a ton of healing from the trauma that I endured as a child, and I've grown immensely as a person. I have a great job, and I'm excelling in my field. I have an incredible support network, and I'm married to the most amazing man I've ever met. I live in a lovely little house, and I'm knocking off goals off my bucket list one after another as I live life to the fullest. I don't think about it nearly as often anymore, but every now and then, all that weird shit with Matthew comes right back to me. I have no idea what the hell he was planning on doing the night he pulled up outside my job, but I'm glad I never found out. I sometimes wonder where he is now. I genuinely hope that wherever he is, he's gotten the psychological help that he desperately needed, and that he's living with a healthier mindset and pattern of behaviors. But most importantly, I just really hope that he hasn't gone on to hurt anyone else. My name is Wires. Not my real name, but for the story's sake, I'll be replacing all of the names of the parties involved. I'm a 20-year-old trans man, but when the story happened I was 18, and the people at my work treated me as a woman. I worked in a supermarket, in the department that can both make you a sandwich or cut your meat. That was my first job, and I was honestly trying way too hard to impress my managers, which I later learned wasn't worth it, but that's another story. I was on a station which consisted of refilling food in a buffet-style bar. Basically all the food just out in the middle of the store with enough plastic containers to clog the ocean for a decade. I had two co-workers. One was a middle-aged woman who had an adult son, and she was great to work with. I really loved that lady. However, she was day shift. So we only had a couple of hours working together before the other night shift worker came in. For this story, I'll call her Kate. Now, Kate was in her 40s. She was also shorter than me, which is surprising considering I'm 5'3". Now, back then, I really liked to assume the best of people. I've learned better now. But even then, I was immediately unsettled when I met her. Even in all of my naivety, something about her just felt off. Wrong. Now, I really like to follow my gut instincts, and to this day, it's never proved me wrong. If I don't like someone with no reason, later on something about them will surface. Her eyes scared me. I grew up under rather traumatic circumstances, so I'm not unfamiliar with a thousand-yard stare. This wasn't that. This was something completely different. Her eyes were wide, far too wide and her pupils might as well have been pin pricks. They never dilated, never moved. Now that I think about it, I can't even remember ever seeing this woman blink. Now, Kate was very talkative, very talkative. She would talk to me all day to the detriment of me doing my job. Since I was barely an adult and mentally very much still a kid, I didn't want to be rude to her. I also didn't want to get on her bad side. The way that she talked unnerved me. She talked softly and quietly, but with a voice full of anger. She would be talking about a band she liked, and it would sound like she was telling me that someone kicked her dog. She was divorced, and she let everyone know about it. She hated her ex with a passion, and I will say, even though I'm not sure if her stories were true, he sounded like a bad person. Cade said that he was emotionally abusive, and that's why she was so paranoid. And oh boy, was she. As someone who grew up with and still suffers with PTSD and severe anxiety, I at first chalked up her strange behavior to trauma, and I tried my best to be understanding. The other workers, however, quickly got annoyed at her antics, as she was constantly complaining and inserting herself in conversations that had nothing to do with her. Deep down, I just knew something was wrong with her, but I really didn't want to think it was the trauma. I thought I could maybe comfort her or maybe help a bit by sharing some of my own trauma at her request, showing her she wasn't alone. 
However, even though she would ask me strangely personal questions about my home life, such as if I was dating anyone, questions about my past and family, and when I tried to answer, she would always interrupt with her own life stories. I don't mind, but I did wish if she wanted to vent, she could have just done it without asking me to share, then cutting me off. The longer I worked with her and the more she talked, I noticed that her stories were, well, skewed in her favor. Many times her stories were her being less than kind to someone, then getting angry when they called her out. She also cussed a lot, which to a freshly out of hyper-controlling religion me, was a bit much. Her behavior started to worry me. As well as talking, she would softly sing, mostly hymns. She started seeming, well, sociopathic. But even more than that, she started paying a little bit too much attention to cleaning our knives. The knives we used were small, but very sharp. But only after she started slacking off on the job in favor of blabbing my ear off as I worked, did I start to get upset with Kate. Then it happened. Remember those plastic containers I mentioned on the bar? Well, I had to go to the back room, basically in a warehouse in the back of the store to get more. Now, the back was unsettling at best. It was filthy, falling apart, and the lights in our stockroom in particular were all out. The only light was the one above the door a little bit down the hall from the room, so the whole room was backlit. Creepy, right? Not only that, but that back room for the whole year I worked at the store just didn't feel right at all. A chill went down my spine every time I had to go back there. But anyway, I went to the back alone, and I pulled out our box off the shelf. It took me a second, as the shelves were tall and I was short, when I suddenly felt my heart drop. A soft, barely hearable voice was singing Jesus Loves Me from behind me. I whipped my head around to see over my shoulder, and backlit in the entry to the room, standing in the hall, was Kate. I laughed nervously as I picked up the box. Oh, Kate, it's you. You surprised me. Yeah, I was just getting more containers, but if you want to get them, I do have to go wipe the bar down. At this point, she had really surprised me and thoroughly creeped me out, but I tried not to judge. After all, some people are just creepy. I shared this with my coworkers, who seemed more alarmed than I was. I was treating it as just a funny story as she walked into the department. She was holding the box and one of our knives, which I assumed she used to open the box. Thinking back on it, the box was still sealed, and we had a box cutter. But months later, I had started to get more upset with her and I could tell that she had started to genuinely dislike me. I was expressing this to a day shift coworker named Kim who was a transfer. As I talked, her face became concerned. I used to work with her at the other store. I don't know how she even got hired here. She's absolutely nuts. Like she threatened to kill everyone in the store and had to be escorted out and banned. That's what she told me. I went into a full-on panic attack. I had encountered psychopaths in the past, and it was honestly terrifying that I'd been so close to one for so long. I had given her every chance when I should have just followed my gut. She ended up quitting a week after that, all because our manager was just asking her to do her job, as she had started to slack off, barely doing anything around the store. I was relieved as my co-workers promised to protect me from her should she come into the store. But weeks after she was gone, even now, I still find myself wondering. That day in the back room, what was she planning on doing in the dark, all alone with me with a knife? It really gives me the chills thinking about that. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night, everyone. And remember, to always, stay hungry.